I prepared this talk today between 4.30 and 6 a.m., so be aware of this fact, if something goes extremely wrong. Uh, yeah, but the, the idea was to uh, somehow describe how a real compiler, such as GHC, does type checking, which is it sort of simple, but has some subtleties, so I thought, well, maybe people could be interested in this. Uh, so I don't know uh, whether any of you is used to this kind of notation in which you write things like this. Have you ever seen this? Okay. Or well, just how programming language people used to write like A and B implies C. But if you don't know the notation, we can just yeah. use the normal one. Okay, so, uh, well, full Haskell is a really big language. So in order to type check it, usually you think like you transform a bit to a simpler language, like lambda calculus, and then you go on uh, with that. So in, in, in my case, what I'm really, really going to explain is how you do type checking the same way as GHC does, but for a smaller language, which will be just lambda calculus. So essentially you only have three things you can do. You can uh, either have a variable. So, I mean, like you have uh, equals equals or ID or whatever. You can have application. So some function F applied to some argument X or you have abstraction. So lambda X to some something like this, some, something inside. So this is what we are going to type check, actually. Uh, so, well, uh, if we move into how the inference is done, it would be nice to think about what does it mean to be type correct for this simple language. And, and for this, we first need to introduce one extra thing, which is called an environment. So, yeah, programming language people usually call them capital gamma. It doesn't really matter, but if you ever see things, that they always use this. And the idea, these are just pairs of a, a symbol, an identifier, and a type. So this is gonna be like the context in which you type check. So if I use something like one equals two, I need to know what equal is. What is the type of equals? So this is coming from all the signatures and this is what it's gonna be on the environment. Okay, so if we have something like this, what does it mean to be uh, type correct? So, uh, well, the simple case is a variable. So a variable is gonna be type correct if uh, well, the type you assign to the variable is the same as you had in your environment. With one small caveat. So, if you have something like equals, the type is going to be something like uh, EQ A to A to A to A. But remember that in Haskell we have like a for all here. So, this is really quantified. So we are gonna say that, that a type you assign to equals is, is, well, is, is a correct type if it's an instantiation of this. So we can, we can say that equals equals is of type, for example, int to int to int. So that's when we call this thing well type. So essentially that means that uh, an identifier is type correct even only if in the environment there is some X with some type T which is in the environment and and uh, yeah, sorry. it's a variable has type R and R is an instance of t. Does it make sense? 
So we can take the for all and replace it with whatever we want. Now, the other two cases are a bit more simple. So uh, when, when an application has type B, well, in order for this to be the case, so remember that an application is of the form F to E. So what we need to have is that F has some type A to B and E has type A. So if you apply A to B to A, you get something of type B. And the trickier one is an abstraction. So an abstraction will always have a type of the form A to B because it's, it's going to be a function. So how do we check this? So remember an abstraction has lambda x to some e. So this happens if e has type b. But the trick is you use an extended environment, because when you are inside the abstraction, now you have one more identifier you can, you can call, which is x. Has type b in an environment where x has type A. So this doesn't tell you how you infer types, but this tells you how to check that something is well typed. These are the rules of our language. So is this clear? So, and that, does it make sense? Uh, so the next step is trying to see, OK, there are some things here that actually we are guessing. Because, for example, I've said here is an instance. But if you try to infer a type, you, you need to find this instance. You need to find that where I, when I write 1 equals 2, this equals has to be instantiated with int. The same happens for the lambda. So you write lambda x dot blah, blah, blah. But you have to find the type for, for x. So here, I'm assuming you know it, and you can check it. But if you are type inferencing, your goal is to you know, guess this type. So this thing is something you need to guess. This is something you need to guess. And one, well, in, in a simple language like Haskell, you don't really need to guess a lot here. Because well, you know, if you guess this type and you get this type, then you, you only compare them. If you go to more complicated languages, actually, you also need to make some guesses here. So, OK. So how, how does GHC does all of this work? Yeah, it's OK. So it uses, it, it does it in two phases. So it gets a program, that, that's your program. And then it runs a process called gathering. And then it generates a bunch of equations, constraints. I mean, people in, in GHC call them constraints. So let's call it constraints. They are really something like equations that your program must satisfy. And then you go to a solver, and this gives you a solution for these equations. So in, in that way, it's, it's sort of simple. Uh, so let, let's start with the simple case for this. So if we want to infer the type of uh, an application, so we want to infer the type of this. What do we do? Well, we first gather all the equations for f. So I'm going to call it C1. It's the, like if we use denotation, like the, these are the, the gathering of F. So you apply this process to F. Then you apply this thing uh, to E. And then you add sort of an extra equation. So it, it must be the case that the type of f 
must be equal to the type of e to something we don't know, some, some new variable x. So this is sort of what we get for application. We just take all the equations and add this extra equation that our whole program has to satisfy. OK, does it make sense? Uh, so because you usually tend to uh, refer to type F and type E all the time, when you write this down, usually you assume that your gathering actually gives you like a type and a set of equations. So I'm going to do the same here. I'm going to call this the type of F. I'm going to call it the type of E. And then I'm going to say that the type of F must be the type of E to some X, which is completely new variable. So where X is new. And people in programming languages would say X is fresh because it's like a fresh new variable which nobody have ever seen before. OK, so we have the, the, the simplest case, which is just application, right? So let's now move on to abstraction. So this is actually even a simpler thing. So remember that we said that type checking and abstraction is the same as type checking E, but in an extended environment. So this gives us one insight. Actually, our gathering some somehow refer to this environment. We cannot type check something without knowing what surrounds this thing, what are the identifiers which are available. So I would just go and add this gamma here. So, so again, what, what's the type of the abstraction? So we will get a type of E, some constraints for E, and we need to do the same gathering to get the equations, but now our our environment is, is bigger. So we, we put something else. I don't know how to write it, like cons. Cons. And we put x with a type. And, and what's the type of this, of this thing? We don't know yet. So we do as, as we did here. We just say, well, a fresh variable, a. And we just go and type check the e. And again, where a is new. OK. And if you've done all of this, and you know all the constraints for the thing, and you know what's the type of e, and we know that x should have type a, well, we know that somehow the type of the whole thing must be A to type of E. And the constraints are the same. Does it make sense, this, these two things? So right now we are just adding equations. So this thing will just add more and more equations. If all of these are satisfied, that means our program is type correct and we can get what everything is. So we are just missing one case, which is the case of the variable, which is uh, well, if you've seen this, if you understood this, it's sort of simple. So you have a variable, x. So what you do is you try to find uh, the type. So you try to find this in gamma. So you, you, you try to find this x. Otherwise, what you have is a scope problem. You're referencing some, something which doesn't exist in this, in this context. And then what's, what's the trick here? So I, if, if we were in a very simple language, I could just say, well, actually, return t and no equations. You know, what's the type of, of x? Well, that's what it's on the environment. But in Haskell, remember that we have this for all things. So we have to do an extra step called instantiation, which basically replaces all the things which are quantified with new variables. So I will just first write here like instantiate t and no equations. Uh, so I think that the easiest thing is to look at an, at an example. So 
let's try to type check uh, something simpler. Uh, ID of true. Imagine we want to type check this thing, and so what we would do is well, this is an this is an application, so we go here. So oh, first we need to gather, but it's in F. So we first need to gather ID. So we know ID has type for all A. Uh, we know that uh, yeah, ID has type for all A, A to A. That's what the type it has. But this is not something we, we can just put there. We need to instantiate before. So what we do is just take this, all these A's and replace them by new fresh variables. So we just get a new variable and we just say, well, the type of this, it's going to be some B to B. We don't know what B is yet. It could be anything. And we have no equations. And now we go to true. Well, true has, in the environment, has type bool. There is nothing to instantiate because just, it's just a simple type. So we can just return bool and no equations. OK, so we've already done these two things. And now we need to add this extra equation. We need the, the type of f, which is b to b, must be equal to the type of bool to a new x. So this is actually the only equation you would get for this, for this program. And if you, I will describe later how you actually solve this thing. But intuitively, you just go and see, oh, b must be equal to bool. So if I take b equal to bool, these two b must be the same because they are the same thing. So x must be equal to bool. So the, the solution is b is bool and x is bool. So we found actually both what is the return type of the whole thing, which could be bool. It would be this x. And what is the b we need to instantiate id to. So I mean, this is actually what, what GHC does. So it generates a bunch of these equations and just goes and solves it. Uh, so yeah, I could just finish here. But there are, there are uh, three things which makes this thing a bit more complicated. Uh, so the first complication is you need to solve them. And you know. GHC, I mean, it's not like Simon Peter and John comes and stares at your equations somewhere in Cambridge and then says, ah, that's your solution. You actually need a procedure for this. But, well, the good thing is this procedure is really, it's, it's been well studied. It's called unification. It's, it's, I mean, people know how to solve this from, I think it's 50, 56. Somebody called Robinson found a way to do this thing. But, uh, you can actually think about it, and it, it wouldn't be so complicated. So what are the cases you have? So all the types in Haskell, if we assume that we don't have these for alls, are, go are going to be either a variable. So it are going to be yeah, either a variable, let's call it A, B, whatever, or a constructor applied to some other types. So you're going to be. So something of the form a constructor t applied to some other type t1, tn. So like this thing would be the constructor arrow applied to b and b. And here the constructor arrow applied to bool and x. So if we have a bunch of these equations, which are the rules? Which are the rules which allow you to get the solution? Well, you just define a set of Simplification thing is like what you do in high school where you try just to simplify equations and did you get to a point where it says x equals 3 and well, that's the, the solution. So you, you have basically a, just three cases. So the, the first thing is that you may have t applied to some types, t1 to tn, equal to the same constructor applied to some r1 to rn. So like in this case. Then what you would do is just to, OK, we know that these are equal. If these things are equal, all these things must be equal. So we just say t1 must be r1 and so on until tn must be rn. So we just 
go generating a new equation. So this, again, is an equation which could be as complicated as you want. You have another, another case, which is, OK, if you tell me that a variable a is equal to, ton, to some type t, and it happens that we have another equation where I don't know how to, 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 to write this, but if you have another equation, so uh, another equation where an, an equation E where A appears, then what you get is a new equation E where A is substituted by T. That's essentially like if you're in high school, if you now know that x equals 3, you go everywhere else where you have x and you just substitute the t there. So you, you get a solution and substitute anywhere else. And there are the, fail the failure cases. So if you have like a t of something equal to s of something, and these are different constructors, this is, is yeah, it's an error. So if you get like list of A must be equal to A to B. Well, one, ha one starts with a constructor list, the other starts with a constructor arrow. This is wrong. I'll give you a type error. And there is a, another small case, which is uh, that this allows having infinite types. So if you have an equation like A equals list of A, this is also wrong. Because the only solution for this would be like an infinite amount of, of list. So this also gives you an error. E explaining how you check this, it's a bit complicated, but OK. You also have to rule out these problems. So these are just, you know, you just apply this, and you either get an error, or you get a bunch of equations of the form A equals type. That's all. You've solved the problem. So first thing done. OK, the second problem is that Actually, types in Haskell are a bit more complicated. So I've, if you see, I've completely uh, omitted any reference to type classes. So OK, what if instead of ID, I use equals? Well. So here is the trick. The thing is that now you see to those things as new kinds of constraints, of new kinds of equation to be satisfied. So uh, the, the, the rule for the variables, which before was something like, let's try to find an R. So you find this thing in the environment, and then just return this instantiate R and no equations, that, that this no longer works. Because you need to also satisfy the restriction that A must, must satisfy EQ. So what you do is just replace it with a, a bit more complicated rule, which says, well, try to find in the environment a, what is here. OK? And what you would get, in general, will have always this form. It will be for all, and then a bunch of variables, so a, b, whatever, set. Then you will have some constraints, like eq, and then a type t. So this is, in general, that's the, the, the form of every type of, of an element in, in Haskell. So it might be that you don't have any variable. It might be that, you, like, bool, like true, it has type bool. It's just there are no, none of these set. There is no constraint, you just have a type. So the trick now is that you instantiate both things. So you need to instantiate t, but also variables may appear here. So you need to instantiate. Uh, so that's all. So imagine now I have here. Uh, equals. So now, instead, I will get something like b to b to b with the extra eqb. And now I will get 
just this type with an extra EQB because I need, sort of I need to put all these these two things together. The equation should be put together. So solving would be sort of similar. You will just get the solution of this would be well, b <coughs> must be bool and x must be bool to bool. And you have this extra requirement that well you will once you replace b equals bool here you will get eq bool and you just go around find your instance and say hey there is an eq bool so that's your solution that's right um, so if you introduce type classes we, we got the gathering part working now we need to have these extra rules being extended and well, this, this is a bit more complicated, not too much, but uh, essentially what you, the other kind of thing that you can have is uh, have something of the form a class applied to some type. And you can have diff multi-parameter type classes and you can have more of them, but just let's focus on one case. So if you have this thing, you essentially uh, need to look at the set of instances. So you first look at the set of instances. And well, you have two cases. You either don't find anyone or uh, yeah, you find one instance which says C of your T and then here some other uh, context D of T, blah, 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 E of T. So what you do is you take this equation, C of T, and replace it with all of this. So in this case, where we, where we had EQ bool, you can think like EQ bool has no prerequisite because you just write instance EQ bool. So this EQ bool is just replaced with an empty equation an empty set of equations to so just, you have the solution for this one. Uh, but imagine that instead of this, I got this of true. So now, now I have a list of true and I have to check EQ of list of bool. Well, I, I know I have an instance which says instance EQ of A goes to EQ list of A. So I just look and say, oh, this instance matches my, my thing. So I will just replace EQ bool, list of bool with EQ bool. And now I have another instance which says instance EQ bool. So I replace EQ bool with the thing here, which is nothing. So this is just erased. So that's how you would type check the, the whole thing. So, I mean, it looks like, okay, it's super simple, but this is actually how it works. So it will, you can actually look at the, at the output of the compiler and get all the equations and see all the steps being taken. Uh, of course, there is, I mean, there is work involved on how you, in, how you actually, again, okay, what does it mean look at the set of instances? Of course, you need to have this safe in your, HA files and find there and so on. So there is a lot of more complication, but, but at a high level, this is how, how it works. So some, any question up to here? Because then I'm gonna go into much harder things. So any questions? You don't look convinced. Yeah. Um, I, this is probably a super stupid question. So in one, uh, when you said, uh, of the ranges from one to n, how does a GHC compiler know what range to check, or is there a? Um, well, ev every. Uh, okay, so. Am I asking the, the right? Question? No, no, no. That, that's the right question. So, uh, so uh, I'm I'm simplifying here a bit sure. because because actually what would happen is that. Uh, 
so the same the same way when you have application, this is really like application of something right. to something else. Right. So you could also see your types as being uh, actually like applying a type T1 to a type T2 equal R1, R2, and then you just need to say T1 must be R1 and T2 must be R2. And then add like an extra zero equation saying like T equals T is always satisfied. So what then what would happen is that they will just go to the last one, say there must be equal and all the rest must be equal. Right. Then the, and then they will get just to a point where there is only one okay. and just say, right, this must be equal to this other one. Oh, right. okay. So uh, yeah, but it, if you try to read like where they explain, they usually take this simpler approach. And you just assume you know, because when you declare a data type, right. you declare how many parameters it has. Right. So you assume you know this somehow. Right. Uh, in practice, people just do this, which is a bit more complicated to explain, a bit is simpler to program, because then you, you know, checking this thing is, is simpler. Right. Right. Okay, Any more questions? OK. So let's go to the third complication. Uh, yeah, I don't know what. Ah, great. I can use another whiteboard. OK, so this, this procedure I've shown you uh, is great for inference. It allows you to infer the type. And it has a nice property, which is that it gives you what it's called the principal type. It gives you the most general type. So if you write like lambda x dot x, it will never give you int to int. It will always give you a to a for some unknown a. So this is very, very nice. But, but that's not how people write Haskell. So uh, when people write Haskell, they will have like, f is my id of x, let's suppose something like this. Uh, this is a stupid program. So people will write this. So this essentially would be something like a to list of a. Uh, but I can go and write here int to list of int. And this is, this is a right program, isn't it? Uh, so somehow we must be able not only to, uh, to check, I mean to infer, but also to check. <coughs> OK, so uh, the first. A case like this is actually pretty simple because, well, you just can get all your equations and then you will get some, some type for this. And then you add an extra equation saying the type of this must be equal to int to list of int. And then, well, you, you, I mean, it either gives you a solution and it gives you an error and then this is wrong. If I just drop this here, it will just tell me, well, this is wrong. But what happens if we have suddenly something like this? OK, again, this is a very s stupid thing, but it, it goes with the narrative of what we've been looking at. So the most general type we can assign to this is something of the form for all a, eq, a, uh, a, to list of a to So you get a type, uh, x, uh, something a here, you apply it here, you get the list, and then well, you will get a bunch. You can, if you, if you are very bored tonight, you can just get this type. You can, you know, add all, get all the equations following the rules we've shown before. Uh, but the thing is, we are also allowed to write or here. And because or is a, subclass of EQA, this should type check. Uh, so 
we cannot just take this or and put it in the set of equations because this is not an, something we need to figure out. This is something that is given to us and we can use it to uh, hi, uh, to solve the equations. So what you need is to, the things you have, which you have the set of equations, now becomes two sets of equations. And this, these are usually, well, in GHC, they are called the givens and the wanted. So what you will get is something like, well, what do you want? Well, what you want is that your A uh, is an instance of EQ, because you need it for EQ, uh, equals. But you are given some extra information. You know that your or, uh, your A satisfies or. So the trick is you can actually do the same kind of simplifications. And because, well, you know the, that that or, ha uh, so you have class EQA implies or A. Because you have or A, you also know that EQA must hold. So your given equation can be changed to EQA here. But this is just doing the same kind of simplification, but on the set of things you know, not of the set of things you want. And these are the same rules. And then you, have, you just add one extra rule, which is if you find the same thing, you cross them out. Well, you actually don't cross this out because you can use it more. But if you have something and the same thing and want it, well, you already, you already solve it. You just need to, that's the solution because it's something which is given to you. Uh, so this is essentially how, how you can type check any kind of complicated declaration. You just get your givens, which are just the things you have in your type signature here. You get your wanted, which is what, do we, what would you get from this gathering process. You put all of them, you apply the rules here, you apply the rules here, and then you cross everything out. If you are missing something in your wanted, then you will get one of those errors saying, there is no instance for EQ A to B. Because the, it's missing here. I couldn't cross this out. So you, you, I don't have a solution for this, essentially. Uh, does, does this thing make sense? OK, so we are going to use the, the same idea. I think I have some. Oh, I have more, a lot of time. Uh, to go to the most complicated thing that, you, that happens in GHC, which is type checking a pattern matching. So type checking pattern matching is, it gets very hairy very soon. So, uh, so in general, you will have something like case E of, and you have here like a constructor one with some variables, and then you have here what you do in this case, and you have a bunch of these things. So uh, at least expressing all of this as a rule for gathering is going to be quite complicated. It's going to be much longer because you have n possible matches, and you have an expression to match, and all of this is sort of interrelated. So first of all, I will assume that here you only have variables. You don't have uh, more matches. And in general, you can all, every time you have like a complicated match, you can put them into just a set, uh, a series of, uh, of matches which just match constructor and variables all the time. It, there is a paper from 85, I think, which tells you how to do this. It's, 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 more tri it's trickier than it seems. So you cannot just, because if you have overlapping things, then it gets uh, complicated. But OK, so I will assume here that you have some, some variables here. So if we want to find out what is the type of this, OK, what do we do? So let, let's try to gather this thing. So clearly, we, we need to. Uh, we need to gather the constraints for this thing, the equations for this expression. So we will have a type here, some equations, and this is just gathering the E on this environment, gamma we've been talking about. The next thing we need to do is, okay, we know all of these constructors. 
So how does a, con a type of a constructor look like in Haskell? So in general, it's going to be something like k has type, again, for all a, blah, 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 to set. You will have, like, uh, a type 1 to type n, and at the end, it's the type of uh, the type uh, the type you are building applied to a to z. So, like, if you have the type of cons in Haskell, this is gonna be for all a a to list of a to list of a. So it has this form, and at the end you have the type applied to all the arguments here. So that's yeah. Oh, just to make it clear where things come from. So uh, <clears throat> in Haskell, we don't write it usually. But of course, inside of the compiler, there is always a for all. Uh, so I'm, I'm just using it, uh, trying to be explicit that where does the, this A come from? I mean, I could just erase it and then just say, well, there is a new A. But. OK. so. This is the type of the constructor, and we have a bunch of this. So, uh, so what are the so let's try to find out what are the equations for this branch. So first of all, whatever the type of of uh, E is, it must be T applied to something. So we know that we have an equation that T is T of A to Z for new a to z. So this is just telling, OK, what I look here must, if I have a constructor k1, must be of the same type. And you can see this already reads out the case where you are matching different uh, constructors from different types. Because if you have several branches with different types, you will have two of these equations, and one will say t, and the other will say r, and well, you will get an error because they don't match. So what is the next thing? Now we need to, we got into this branch, so now we need to gather what is happening in E1. Uh, so we just do gathering. So we will get some type one and some constraints one. But as in the case of lambda abstraction, we have one extra thing. Now E1 can, can use all this x here. So that means that our environment has to be extended with all this information. So we will have our gamma, but then we put there. And what do we put? So we have, OK, I don't know how to call it, because it will be like x11 to x1m something like this, like a bunch, like m variables, which are in the first branch of your case statement. So, I don't know if that's it's like too many indices. OK. So essentially, what, do, what we do now is we say, OK, you can access x11. And which is the type? Oh, we look at the constructor. It's, it must be t1. And we add all the x1, m. So I mean, writing it like this is a bit complicated, but you can think like, OK, I just use a larger environment where I can get all this x here. Yeah? Uh, the camera just like the gamma. So we are, uh, the gamma is the environment coming from. from yes. Exactly. So it's the things which are in a scope in a given point in the program. That would be the environment. I've seen, I've seen some of it before, but I'm not. Would that, so you have gamma colon, would that like in different notation be a turnstile? Uh, okay. Okay. So if you write the papers, people don't write gathering like this. So when I, when I write gather, so I'm, I'm using TC gathering gamma e, people will write this as gamma turnstile e t arrow c. 
Huh? I'm more used to the second one, which is really smooth. Uh, no, yeah. Uh, yeah, okay. yeah. I'm also. I mean, I also. I'm used to this, but this. Uh, what oh, I, I don't like about. I uh, what I don't like about this notation is that it doesn't tell you what is the input and the output, and I think this is more explicit about. You know, you give environment, you get expression, and you get back type and constraints. Uh, okay, so we just put all of them, and we do this for each branch. So actually, this would be like we do this for each branch. OK, so we just go around all of this thing for everything. And we are just missing one more equation. OK, you found out all the types here. But if in order for this to be correct, all of them have, have to agree. Otherwise, this wouldn't work. So we just say, well, t, t1 must be equal to some b. Uh, uh, the usual trick is not to say they are all equal, just to introduce a new thing and say they are all equal to this other thing. Else, like t2 must be equal to b. So this is how you do uh, pattern matching in in simple pattern matching on GHC. So again, the nice thing is with now the second part, the solving part, doesn't need any change. We just need to do this. Uh, we just need to think a bit more, think a bit about what it means to be well type for this, but sort of it comes uh, for free. Except for one thing. There are these terrible people that in the early 2000s invented GADTs. So this makes the th whole thing terribly more complicated. Well, not terribly more complicated, but because now, when we have a constructor here, we can also have some constraints here. And the weird thing is the semantics of this means that when you build a new element using constructor k, you need to satisfy c. But when you use it, when you pattern match, all of this C becomes available to you for free. Uh, so um, that means, essentially, that you are not only putting things on your box of wanted, but that's what we're doing now. We, you are also putting things on your box of givens, because these things are now given to you. So this looks simple, but what's the problem? OK, imagine I have a data type, very stupid data type, but so imagine now I have x. x. So uh, does everybody know what this means, what this notation means? GDT notation? OK. So this. so this doesn't match this thing, because I, I need to have A to set. I need variables. But you can always do the following trick. You can just say, well, x of A, and here write for all A, where A must be equal to bool. And that's what Haskell people write to, like to write with a a squiggly thingy, which I don't, I don't know how to, I, I don't know English enough to know what's the name of this symbol. Tilde. Huh? Tilde. Tilde. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, it's just an equality. Huh? Okay. So you, you write this thing, and. What's, what's the problem? Imagine I just put, you know, things on my box of givens. When I pattern match over this thing, I will get x, uh, a equals bool, and a equals int. That's the problem, because a cannot be bool and int at the same time. So that means if I just take this simple approach, I'm doing, I'm doing it wrong. So the, the real, the real the real thing here is that actually you 
should only have this given to, to solve the equations coming from this branch. So you need to introduce a new kind of constraint, which is what yeah, in GHC it's called like an existential constraint. Uh, so essentially, right now, so imagine I have this C1. All of this is OK, but I, I, I don't use C, C1 as it was given to me. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I should let me call it D1 so it's different. I, there is one extra thing in, in GHC which tells you, well, you actually, it's written like this, you need to solve C1 assuming D1 holds. But now this, this is only for this C1. So you need, you know, you, you use different Ds for different Cs. But that means that the solver has to do, well, every time it finds one of these implications, this uh, thing, it needs like to hold on for a second. I'm going to look at these equations assuming these things. Let's do my job. And once I'm done, I like unassume these equations before going to the next D N. And uh, yeah, that's, that's what's happening. And this makes it impossible for the, for the, for the different Cs to have uh, from the different Ds to collide together. Uh, actually, well, I have five more minutes. So uh, this actually gives rise to another problem, which is that sometimes there are things which have a solution, but GHC is not able to find it. Yeah. Yes. Uh, is that the order context? No. That's, I mean, it might be related, but I mean, this, this is the formulation using like the outside in paper, this 70 page long. Yeah. The complete and easy, I have to admit that I don't understand the paper fully, so I don't agree with being easy. I agree with being complete. <laughs> uh, gotcha. okay. But uh, I guess there is, there is something, the, there is a difference here which is that uh, here all of this is really sets of constraints. There is no order, which if you go to like higher rank polymorphism, you, you sometimes say, yeah, you really need an order that like this depends on this. Here, it doesn't really matter. So, uh, so that's it. With this, you can essentially type check all of your Haskell expressions because, well, we got Application, uh, abstraction, uh, variables, and pattern matching. So, I mean, if you want to do, do notation, you just translate it to binds and and your things, and you're done. Yeah. Uh, can you do like a full run through of an example? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah okay. Yeah. So, let's. So, ah. huh? no. Okay. Let anyway. Let's try to type check this thing, which is so. Is X B would be essentially if you have X B, it will be true. If X B Yeah. Or let us make it a bit more interesting by actually saying here int for the sake. Uh so of course this is not what you will do, I mean, this is what you write, but actually this is related into a lambda where you have lambda x case x of x b 0 x i n n. So that's, that's what we see here. So we need to do the whole gathering process. 
So, okay, we start. I, I'm gonna do it by hand because it's otherwise it's just I'm just gonna fill the thing without many many real content. So, just start with your whole environment, which is well will will include things like what is x b, what x i, zero, n. Okay, you go into a lambda, so the, that means now we have in the environment also an x with a new unknown type a. Uh, yeah, because in order not to confuse with this, I will call it B. So it's not the same A as here. Okay, now I look at, I, I have a case expression. So the first thing to do, I need to do is to gather what is here. So I go to gathering what is in the X. So I'm going to just do it like putting some annotations here. So the type of this, I look it on the environment, it must be B. And it has no constraints. It's, I mean, it's of type for all without any variable, without any constraints. So I have no equations coming from, from this thing. Now I need to check. Well, I'm applying XB and XY. So I know that my B has to have type uh, X of A, because otherwise I couldn't be pattern matching on it. OK? So then I move here, and I say, OK, I'm going to look at xb. It has no arguments. So that means I don't have to make my context bigger in this branch. And I get 0 here. So uh, remember that 0 is actually a literal in Haskell. We had this type num a to a to a. So 0 is for all a, sorry, num a. So I need to instantiate this num a with something. Uh, so which means that the result of this thing is going to be of type, let's call it C, and I have some extra equation to get, which is num C. So that's what I get from this branch. But remember, because I'm in a pattern match in a GADT, I need to introduce this extra information. So now what I really have is A equals bool implies... Uh, num of c. And now I do essentially do the same thing. Now I need to expand my, my environment because I have this n. I look here and I see, well, this n must have, yeah? Is, so is c also an environment now? Uh, this c? No. No, the num c came up here. Uh, no, no. Uh, environment all, only have things appearing here. Right. So. Uh, I will have it later in my final set of equations. So remember that when you, when we are pattern matching, we have an extra set of equations at the end saying, oh, remember that all these things here must have the same type. So I will use it there. So, but I'm, I'm just looking at the branch. Uh, the branch by itself doesn't impose any condition on C. It just, I mean, it imposes with num C. It has the same one as like C has a type. Yeah. OK, let's, let's try to, because I, I should be finished by now. So, oh, five minutes? We have just time. It's 2 o'clock. Um, there's nobody in this room, so you can keep going with the presentation. But if other people have talks that they can go to, it's a 2 o'clock session. Yeah, I'll, I will just be finished in two seconds. So, OK. Essentially, I will get this thing. And now my n has type int. So, well, I really have no constraints here. So, because. This n is of type int, which introduces no constraints. So this is like an no equations. So this is everything I got from going through the branches. Now the last thing, if we have a, a case statement, is we introduce a new d, let's say, and we make all these things equal. So d must be equal to c, and the type of this is int, so d must also be equal to int. And then we solve this thing. So essentially we say, oh, the, the must be equal to int, so, so c must be equal to int, so int is here. We know that namit holds because we have it on the, on the list of instances, so this is gone. No equations here. And now my b must be x of a, uh, which, yeah, this 
gives rise to nothing. So essentially, our type is correct. Uh, just one small thing, so the whole, uh, the whole type of, this, of the case statement is going to be this D, this thing we return, which we know is an int after solving. So this int is going to be right, and this XA, well, we have nothing to say about it, so it's okay. So this thing is, is well typed. If I had here, instead of zero, a true, then from here I will get d equals bool, and here num bool. So I will get two errors. I will get, well, bool is not equal to int, first of all, and there is no instance for bool, for num bool. Sorry. And that's it. Oh, thanks. <laughs>